Okay. Hi there, everybody. Happy World Ocean Day. My name is Tom peacock Nazil, and I'm the founder of Seven Clean Seas. We're an ocean cleanup organization operating in Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia, focusing on community engagement, education, infrastructure projects, and direct action. We're proud to share that we've removed over 54,000 kilos of plastic from the oceans and marine environment since founding in 2018. All our activities have been funded by the innovative solution, Ocean Plastic Offsetting, whereby our partners can achieve plastic neutrality and contribute directly to global ocean cleanup efforts. Being World Ocean Day today, you can imagine this is a very special day in the calendar at Seven Clean Seas. But in case you didn't know, World Ocean Day, it's an international day that takes place annually on the 8th of June and it was officially recognized by the United Nations in 2008. The goal of World Ocean Day is to really support and implement worldwide sustainable development goals, as well as to help foster public interest in the management of the ocean and its resources. And that is exactly what we are here to do today. So please share, like, comment, ask as many questions as possible as we go along because it's going to be an insightful and fun couple of, well, one hour. I'm joined here today uh, by a world-class lineup of panelists. They're here to discuss the topic around real-world solutions for ocean plastic. They're very, very much at the top of their game. They're coming at this from very different angles and disciplines and specialities, but they are all working together on the same issue, which is ocean plastic pollution, and how do we stop that? So without further ado, I would like to welcome our first panelist, Maggie Lee. She is Southwest Asia Plastic and Marine Litter Management for the United Nations Environmental Program, Sea Circular Program. So Maggie, how are you doing? Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, hope you can hear me clearly. Um, thank you so much for the invitation and the warm welcome. Tom. Um, as you mentioned, uh, I do work for the United Nations Environment Program on marine litter and also on the plastic value chain. It's important that we don't equate the two because um, very often nowadays that we see plastic being vilified and people are avoiding plastics because they do believe that there's a direct um, causal relationship between the two and which is true in fact but until recently it has not been proven how one translates to the other we know that um, we've been consuming a lot of plastics in the past 70 years this has been unprecedented back in our gen our grandparents generation um, we've never used so much disposables and that things were actually meant to last but nowadays when we buy anything at the supermarkets or um, or especially now COVID-19 has hit uh, Asia and also the rest of the world very much um, people tend to actually use a lot more disposables be it made from plastics or other materials and we know that plastics is actually a very good solution when you when it comes to actually finding a disposable material that is airproof waterproof oil proof and lasts for a very long time they're extremely durable and they're a great material and so if you look at it in a vacuum it's a great solution for many things Unfortunately, it's also the, 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 its strengths are also its weaknesses because we know that plastics last way too long. And that's also why we end up with so much ocean debris that are made out of plastics. And this is actually the result of us trying to find a panacea. When we see a problem, when we see a bunch of problems, we tend to actually try to find a shortcut in, sh in, in solving a bunch of them in one go. And that's exactly why plastics came to be the big problem. And now a lot of people keep asking us and also myself, um, what do you think of the plastic problem? How can we solve it? Um, what is the next material that could replace plastics? If we keep thinking with this mentality, we're going to end up in a loop. We're gonna end up with more and more problems because there's no shortcuts in actually getting things out. We know that um, the planet will continue to produce a lot more products and that many of them, especially now with the COVID-19 worries on public health, we know that they'll be wrapped in extra layers of protective coating. And so that um, to find out um, whether or not we can replace 
all plastics with another magical material is just repeating history itself. And so that's why um, at the United Nations Environment Program, we are working hand in hand with the private sector, the businesses that were that are currently still producing a lot of plastic materials, be it packaging or be it plastic themselves. I myself came from that private sector. So there's really no excuses in terms of not knowing how it works because the companies I've worked for are the, are the um, food and fast moving consumer good moguls. And we know that they're looking for solutions as well. On the other hand, we're also partnering up with the public sector, meaning the governments of Southeast Asia, and that they're very interested in finding solutions on marine litter as well. As I mentioned in the very beginning of my introduction, um, we cannot figure out a solution for marine litter without looking at plastics. The two come in hand in hand, but they're not a one for one racial by all means. Um, we know that there are many countries that have succeeded in creating a, a rather circular economy. We know that there are many um, solutions out there, for example, alternative materials, for example, reusability. So we know that there are quite a lot of interesting ideas that are popping up. and. With our project at the United Nations Environment Program, our Sea Circular project, we are trying to link solutions with issues and issues with solutions, of course. We are trying to find out what is the best solution for each case. Remember, if we keep bundling up problems and we keep finding panaceas for, um, for a bunch of um, different issues in different places, we're going to end up with a universal problem, much like marine litter once again. And so to avoid having that, um, we'd love to actually get everyone's input on what currently they're experiencing in terms of marine litter or their plastic value chain uh, issues. How are they looking at plastic reduction? Um, what are the policies that need to be in place? We are trying to combine um, the policies so that it would be easier for companies to launch products, for example, in um, a specific region. And so to make it easier for the plastic um, producing private sector to make it so that um, it's not as uh, it's not as difficult and financially burdening for them to look into an innovative material or even uh, an alternative solution by not having disposable packaging, for example. So we know that um, we're working very closely with uh, quite a lot of implementational partners, but that's not enough. We're still looking for more partners out there who are actually um, innovating on the fronts of, um, of plastic credits, offsetting and uh, plastic neutrality, collection, recovery, uh, recycling, and of course, um, the reduction of plastics. There could be many um, ideas out there and each one of them could solve a unique problem in the plastic value chain. And so I ask you to, um, for this World Oceans Day, we ask you to think about first your consumption. And secondly, if you are a decision maker in this industry, or if you're in civil society looking at the same problems we are looking at, I ask you to link arms with us to join this um, overall effort in Southeast Asia, along with 20 other marine litter and plastic projects to come together um, to find solutions so that we don't repeat efforts, we don't reinvent the wheel, and that um, we can um, divide and conquer, we can actually work on solutions together for multiple disciplines in this um, in the industries. And so that uh, that concludes my um, little bit of uh, my two cents and also um, the um, a brief introduction of what we're trying to work on at the project. So please do send me any of your um, opinion and also any questions. Thank you. Yeah, great introduction, Maggie. Thank you so much for that. It sounds like you guys are working on some incredible projects on a multitude of different levels with both government and big like big private sector players as well. So exciting to see how that develops in the coming years. We'll get back to you shortly with some questions, but I'd just like to move on to our second panelist. Um, our, she is called Jocelyn Matthias, and she's the program lead at the Incubation Network. So hi, Jocelyn, how are you doing? I'm doing great, I'm doing great. Um, thanks for including me uh, in World Oceans Day. Um, yeah, I'll just, I guess, dive right in um, if that's what we're doing um, on what, who the Incubation Network is and, and what we do. Um, so um, as uh, Tom, Tom mentioned, um, I'm here today representing the Incubation Network, um, which exists to coordinate and accelerate efforts that reduce ocean plastic pollution and build a thriving circular economy. Um, and by definition, we are a network. Um, and uh, we are a network that brings to get together incubators, accelerators, entrepreneurs, and innovators, investors, NGOs, and government leaders from across 
um, the world to develop and scale solutions for um, uh, that address plastic pollution and um, build a thriving circular economy across um, specifically South and Southeast Asia. And um, I, I guess the center to why we use a network-based approach is because we acknowledge that plastic pollution is a systemic issue um, and a systemic challenge, um, which is what I'll be speaking to a lot today. Um, and systemic issues can only be addressed through a collaborative network um, centered solution, right? Um, that engages a number of different sectors, but also encourages and stimulates a new frontier of innovation that can bring ideas to the scene that may have never been existent before. Ideas that are designed to solve the, the specific problems um, or overcome the specific barriers that we now see that are preventing success and progress in this space. Um, the, the network specifically achieves this through programs and partnerships um, that highlight opportunities for and demonstrate the potential of inclusive, innovative waste management solutions. We do not see the plastics crisis as necessarily a plastics or materials issue. We see it as also a people issue. Um, that plastics and this crisis was not created by the material, but it was created by the way that people and communities interact with this material um, and the way systems are in place to manage it. Um, and so uh, what do those programs, et cetera, look like? So, um, so far, um, the plastics, uh, so far, the incubation network has a couple programs that are currently active. One being the Plastics Data Challenge, which is the first in a series of global challenge, global innovation challenges that the incubation network will run to raise awareness and find opportunities for innovation. Specifically, the Plastics Data Challenge, as its name um, suggests, is focusing on data-driven solutions that address the leakage of plastic into the environment across South and Southeast Asia. So currently, we've actually already built a cohort of 10 amazing innovative solutions that are currently working on designing a pilot that is designed for and fit to address um, key challenges with the collection and um, usage of data across the plastics value chain in communities across um, South and Southeast Asia. They are currently working with a team of over 27 um, global mentors and local advisors that are helping them refine that pilot, that model um, for that pilot and build an action plan to be implementing um, this pilot on the ground in South and Southeast Asia. So quite exciting innovations that we'll actually see entering a piloting and testing stage that collect and help enhance the data that we have on material flows and, and, and plastic waste across the region. Additionally, um, we have upcoming programs like the Circular Innovation Jams, which aim to harness the creativity of entrepreneurs and innovators in emerging markets to develop solutions for local problems. So specifically, the Circular Innovation Jam will be taking place um, in July across five countries in South and Southeast Asia. That's India, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, um, and the Philippines. Um, and uh, it's a week-long ideation event that's going to be bringing together innovative minds to learn about the circular economy and develop new solutions for waste management and ocean plastic pollution. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's a little bit about what, who we are and what we do. Fantastic stuff. It's great to hear that you've actually got a cohort currently going through the system at the moment. When do you think they'll be able to kind of hit the ground and start testing out these solutions? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the first thing I want to acknowledge is our current cohort. Um, they, they've entered the program, and while they all have mo like models and, and functioning prototypes, they're all at different stages in that piloting journey, some more further than others, um, others, uh, others um, kind of more nascent in that stage as well. Um, we have half of our cohort that already has existing kind of pilots or functioning prototypes that are in a different market. They're looking to expand into new communities across South and Southeast Asia, whereas others already have a pilot that they've just gotten to a stage where it needs to be refined and strengthened to scale. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, they're all kind of at different stages. So some are already on the ground, some are entering a new market. Um, and unfortunately, with COVID, those looking to enter new markets um, might be slightly delayed to where we'd love to kind of push them to. But regardless, um, they've all been working together 
um, for over a month. And uh, we'll be working together through July to really refine those pilots. And so that, um, you know, hopefully when all of this uh, current COVID-19 scenario subsides, they'll be able to really hit the ground running. Yeah, absolutely. I think having the incubation network behind them as well through this difficult time must be uh, very comforting for some of them to know that they can just kind of get things ready, work with you guys on what they need to work on, polish it and, uh, and, and enter the other markets when they're able to, which is hopefully sooner rather than later, but who knows at the moment. Um, thank you, Jocelyn. Um, moving on. So our last guest today um, is Dan Jordan. So Dan is a material specialist at Summit Systems in the UK and has direct kind of knowledge and, and activity within the plastics and recycling industry. So I'll let Dan introduce himself fully, but Dan, um, how are you doing, mate? Oh, I think you might be on mute. There you go. Good. I'm all right. I'm good. Thanks, Tom. And uh, yeah, pleasure to be here today. So I say to Justin and Maggie, I really enjoyed your guys' introductions and it's, um, it was really refreshing to hear you've got such a pragmatic approach and a view on the whole ocean plastics thing. It's, um, you get hit with a lot of anti-plastics, plastics are bad, and it sounds like you've got a very rounded and grounded view on the current situation, which is really reassuring to know that we're probably going to end up with a solution sooner than later. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to hear your guys' um, opinions on things in the discussions to come. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, Tom and I, go for, we're friends from a long time back at uni, and um, it's been really good to see your uh, Seven Clean Seas project developed to what it is today. And I've just been advising Tom on all sort of mechanical aspects of recycling and how and why things can or can't be recycled, which is actually quite interesting to be able to look at an understanding why brands might put a certain packaging out there and uh it'll be it, it's been also useful to target brands that are putting out their mindless senseless plastic for the sake of it and we really need to start coming down on those brands and putting the pressure on them to not be putting unrecyclable plastic out there and that's one thing i'm quite keen on is looking at the validity of plastic packaging and does it have a place and can it be recycled and if it can't is it really justified is there anything else that could be used more sustainably in its place so um i've been really campaigning against um unrecyclable plastic packaging but also guiding people towards recyclable plastic packaging that is compatible with whichever country's waste management infrastructure and then typically there's three main polymers plastics hdpe pp and pet are the top three rigid plastics that can be recycled ubiquitously around the world and most places have got an infrastructure for that but then we want to look deeper in understanding the commercials the economics of it and uh, the value chain within plastics which is actually i think it's one of the uk's most valuable commodities at the moment in terms of um if you were setting up a, an infrastructure for waste management one of the main things they target is plastics but if it's commingled and mixed together, it's, it's a big cost for people and there's no incentive to develop that infrastructure. And Tom, you'll probably agree here, we need the infrastructure to start collecting it, to stop it entering our environment and giving it a value. So it'd be really interesting to hear Maggie and Jocelyn's opinion on how we can create that value chain to give the material some sort of substance to stop it becoming just a throwaway waste. And again, looking at the cultural side of things, plastic doesn't end up putting itself in the environment and uh, one one big point I've always looked at is the smoking ban and how quickly in the UK the smoking ban came from something that was never going to be um, achievable to really quite quickly it was a taboo subject you can't even light a cigarette up in a pub or on a plane anymore bang people will criticize you and actively shame you for that I don't see how and why that's not achievable with litter culture and how we can't get into that naming shaming culture quite quickly and fining and being able to stop it at source um that's my aspiration would be to have much tougher fines and social penalties on littering quicker and sooner than poss as possible so it's how do we um put that through legislation and government and looking at some other examples other real life success stories in other industries where things have managed to have been changed quite quickly and uh yeah you must be heartbreaking for you tom at the uh at the front end, picking up the same tide of litter on each different tide coming in and 
this is why we're here today to look at some of those solutions so um yeah i'm going to be offering my opinion on actual physical packaging design um how it could be better looking at real world solutions as to um, reusable packaging and um the, also the bigger carbon effect and the climate change effect which i know tom's certainly been doing a lot of research on and uh, his knowledge base is increased quite considerably in the last year on uh, looking through the, the, the myriad of greenwashing out there and really actually what's going to impact us as a society and a, and a global ocean loving culture in terms of what's going to be best for our grandkids growing up and having a clean thriving ocean i'll yeah, leave it there for me yeah. that was no it's, it's very insightful dan um whilst we're whilst we're on you actually i've got a i've got a, a question directly for you given that you're working kind of on the cold base with recycling heavily and you have been for so long can we just get your kind of input on how the the global kind of oil crash that we're we're living through at the moment kind of oil being at record lows how is this affecting recycling rates and recycling industry um from from your perspective it's not been great and i'll give you a couple of reasons first of all we've in the uk specifically there's the um PRN system, the Packaging Recovery Note System, and the PERN for export packaging. And that's the subsidy given by the government, which uh, tracks at price. So this time last year, the PRN was worth £430 per tonne. So for every tonne that was successfully recycled or exported um, for recycling, the government would give £430 per tonne, which gave a massive incentive for people to rush to recycling. That's down at 200 today, a year later. So it's a lot lower, but still bigger than any other metal, cardboard, um, any other materials that are giving a PRN. The, PR, the plastic one is still really quite high. So there is still incentive to recycle. But what we've got is, um, I've got recycled material. There's two seconds. <laughs> it's like it's this is um, polyprop, polypropylene, which is a uh, recycled material. Now that's PRNable. But the problem is sending that material to end users in the UK that want to use recycled um, with COVID-19 and people being a lot more short staffed. Um, and then with virgin price coming down from say uh, 1300 pounds a ton for polyprop, it's now down at 800 euros a ton. So it's a massive drop. People just, it's so readily available. And without the government, or the, without the government legislation, which isn't arri hasn't arrived yet, it's in the making, um, but there isn't that mandatory government legislation to force 30, 40% recycled content. And therefore, the demand isn't there yet. It's, it's in the pipeline, but it's not there right now when we need it. And um, recycling companies are finding it very difficult because there's no incentive to use it just yet. And Virgin's so cheap and easily accessible. And if you put Virgin in your machine, you don't have to worry about it. It just runs. When you're using recycled material, there could be blemishes, there could be um, issues with it. And people don't want that headache with short staffness. Is that a word? <laughs> Being short staffed, they don't want that as an issue. And then also the deficit between the price of recycled material and the price of virgin is shrunk to such an extent that the incentive really isn't there. There are still people using it, but essentially demand is dropped and supply is the same as where it was. So the product has been devalued. Um, so yeah, we really need government to step in and start to really push recycled content in parallel with consumers demanding change, saying, yeah, we want this uh, PET bottle, for example, demonstration purposes, to have 60, 70, 80% recycled content. We demand that. And actually, we don't mind if it's not perfectly clear. We don't mind if there's a blemish in it. That's good. It's, uh, Primark did a campaign on their paper bags probably about seven years ago, and I saw one on the tube and it was the first time I saw a real life example. And it said, we, this is a green paper bag and it's brown, it was brown, but it said it's the greenest paper bag you'll see. And it's brown with the blemishes of all the recycled paper content in there. That's where we really need to be working towards driving the consumers to lobby the big brands to say it doesn't need to be perfect. Per perfection in packaging is not required for a greener future. Great. So again, that's sort of tailed off at the end, but it's all kind of inextricably linked. So yeah, oil price could do with going up to make Virgin more expensive, and then people would be incentivized to use recycled content a lot more, along with that consumer cultural change to demand it as um, something that's desirable. 
want. We want recycled content. We want to also prove where it's come from. And having the um, ha having the ability to trace back and see it's a legitimate source. People at them now are buying material from the Far East, and it's got false claims of recycled content. So it's virgin, and people are just saying it's got recycled content in, and there's no due diligence being carried out to prove that's recycled content because Virgin's so cheap. They're marketing it as recycled, even though it's not. Brands in the UK are now buying that as recycled and it's Virgin. There's it's no outrageous. proper it tracing of it. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and there's also, last point, which is quite important. There's been abuse of the PRN system in the UK. I've heard quite a few examples of it and, um, where you've got material let's say you've got a bunch of film packaging film that's been bailed up and that's got a real world, real life value of let's say um, 150 pounds per ton so people can turn it into a pellet and they can make that pellet into damp proof cores for houses or construction but the artificial value of that with the prn being where it was at say 300 pounds a ton um almost a year ago they are taking the truck of material shipping it from the uk into europe claiming the PRN, and then that truck's coming back into Ireland, back into the UK, going out to Europe, claiming the PRN, and it's doing a loop. So they're literally driving trucks around Europe, and each time it passes, they claim the PRN on it. And there's people get using recycled. that system. And, you know, the carbon footprint of that, the fuel, everything else, just for people to be profiteering on it. So again, it's very hard to legislate um, those types of it's, abuse. Yeah, so that's a, that's quite an interesting topic looking at, at PRNs in the UK. So for, for our viewers watching, PRNs are a form of extended producer responsibility. This is a, a, good, a, a very often kind of regional level um, uh, strategy towards um, kind of making a more um, conducive environment for recycling and using plastic responsibility uh, responsibly. Now I know that Maggie is working quite heavily in this space as well, um, out of Bangkok regionally. So I don't know, Maggie, if you just want to to add some some information in and around um, kind of extended producer responsibilities. Yeah. So um, the the old saying goes that if you teach him, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. But if you teach him how to fish, uh, you feed him forever. So uh, I think that's actually what um, what we're trying to bring. And uh, I myself, coming from um, both Hong Kong and Canada, um, it's actually very interesting to see these two places. Um, thrive in terms of their recycling culture as a kid you would just recycle anything in um, in canada you'd ask whether this is recyclable and then once you get the hang of it it's very easy to be imprinted in your in your habits in southeast asia we don't see that as a as a habit just yet with singapore um my um, my stomping grounds in my home for the last five years um still not having a a, a very um popular or um or popular culture for recycling people just simply chuck whatever they don't need into the bins um indiscriminately and so for that to happen, I, we need, of course, what uh, Dan mentioned, um, a viable market for recycling. And as Dan has already mentioned, oil prices have tanked. It's become a negative um, uh, price at one point, that it's more expensive to store your crude oil than to actually make something out of it. So it's, of course, you're going to make something out of it. We see plastic production to, we see as in we forecast that plastic production to uh, rise more, especially now that with the COVID-19 scare. Um, I've taken a lot of pictures around Bangkok um, these few months uh, when I do my grocery runs and uh, everything, literally everything that's previously edible and uh, open deli, um, ready to eat, have now been wrapped in plastics. Um, they've used a lot more plastics to segregate and partition the, the diners at restaurants. And we see that as a, as a very big trend. And so with plastic consumption rising, we definitely have all the more the need to actually control how much plastic is being used, especially for disposable or single use um, uh, applications. And so um, the extended producer responsibility is a very good system. Although we have so many of them, it's just like plastics. There are so many different types of plastics. And so do we have so many types of extended producer responsibility uh, schemes, so EPR schemes. We know that quite a lot of uh, countries in Europe have started and uh, have experienced um, lots of difficulties in launching EPR systems, but many of them have succeeded. 
And so to actually get the applications from that, to understand what worked, what didn't work from these countries, and then to apply that to the nascent recycling um, culture in Southeast Asia is definitely a much needed and a very urgent issue for us. But before that can start, we know I need to point out that there are quite a few problems with uh, creating a circular economy from EPR systems. Even when we ask producers to create uh, recyclable materials, and even if the local citizens um, in that geography can recycle properly, meaning that they know how to rinse out these containers and packaging, they know where to put them, and that there are recyclers who would responsibly pick them up and put them into back into um, the um, the supply chain, we still have a lot of problems in, for example, the, the need for this recycled material. As Dan has pointed out, there's a lot of technical difficulties with using recycled material. And that's also why um, previously when I was working for WWF Singapore, we've been vouching already for um, the bigger brands, the global moguls, to start using recycled material, especially here in Asia. We know that there are a lot of new brands and big brands that are already vouching for uh, some sort of a green policy by going completely circular by a certain year. They're saying that we will adopt recycled material in our supply chains, and we will do it by this year, 2025, 2030, wh whichever the year is. The, the trick here is that they often start with Europe and North America and sometimes Australia. It's much easier to obtain recycled material or green raw materials per se in these regions of the, of the world. And Asia always is left almost last. Um, perhaps Africa, Asia and Latin America would be the last ones that they work on. Um, which is a very big problem because we know that marine litter is actually much more prevalent here in this part of the world in Southeast Asia than any part of the world. We know that China and uh, quite a few nations here in Southeast Asia single-handedly um, produce a majority of the marine litter that we have in the oceans today. This is from a few researches that we found. And so um, for us to work on the worst regions last does not make sense to me. And also um, that's definitely not something we want to see. And that's also why we're trying to get businesses to work not just on extended producer responsibility, but step-by-step step leading up to that. It's impossible for me to make you do the splits from the first day. But then if I can actually make you stretch a little bit more and a little bit more day by day, while well, you have nothing to do at home during COVID-19 lockdowns, I'm sure that all of us can actually get something going. Maybe not the full splits, but at least you can be more flexible by the end of this two month lockdown let's say. So this is exactly the type, of, um, the type of exercise that we want businesses to try their hand at. From first, um, knowing their plastic footprint, they need to actually um, look into plastics as if they're plastics. It's not a popsicle wrapper. It's not a, a container for your, for your um, bundle packs. It's not just uh, this hard shell for, for you to wrap your ready to eat items in. It is, it's, it's a very special polymer. It is polypropylene, it is PET. It is different kinds of plastics. You need to look at that in that light from now. Secondly, you need to tally up your plastic um, consumption. Um, instead of just saying that we, we source how many um, um, plastic films per year, you need to understand how, how much tonnage are you sourcing in terms of polypropylene, for example, so that you know how this will go back into the system. This is the first step to many steps. Next, we want companies to be brave enough to disclose their plastic footprint. And this is very tricky. We know that nobody wants to air their dirty laundry out. And um, by posting these numbers into your um, sustainability reports, or even if you're brave enough to put into your annual, annual reports, this will be very daunting for a lot of companies, especially the ones I've worked for. And so that's also why we need to give them the safety net. When companies are really taking these steps to eliminating unnecessary plastics, um, they need to first show how much plastics they're using. You cannot manage what you, does not, what you do not measure yet. And so that's why we need to encourage companies by positive reinforcement, by conditioning them to actually go ahead with this type of measurement. We shouldn't condemn companies that are really trying to control their plastic footprint. And so that's also why we want to urge them on, cheer them on, celebrating every step. And once you get to that step of disclosure, you're much closer to controlling your plastic footprint and also consumption and eventually a reduction if you're committed to that. And that's also part of the plan is for them to actually commit to a plan. And so if I put it into analogies that 
um, a lot of us gain some weight <laughs> when we're not allowed to go to the gym or when we're just binge eating, watching Netflix at home with nothing else to do. But um, the first thing is that we need to know what a healthy diet is and then keep to it. And that's also the essentials of, um, of maintaining a, a healthy footprint um, of or healthy plastic consumption footprint. We need to know your weight first. So you better be brave enough to go on that scale to measure your, your weight now to know how many stones you put on or how many kilograms you put on. And then you make a plan for that. You make a healthy eating plan, you make a workout plan. So this is really sim simple. And we're hoping that as, um, as a program, Sea Circular can get more businesses to do that. And while that is happening uh, in parallel, we're hoping that we can also get governments to support this type of policy with market-based instruments. So it could, it could be a subsidy, it could be in the form of a campaign, it could be in the form of, for example, Dan mentioned that um, there are subsidies given in the US for recyclers, and we're hoping that that could also happen so that we close the loop both ways. Yeah, absolutely. And we've spoken to a lot of big companies since starting Seven Clean Seas, and I think there are a amazing amount of companies that are terrified to step on that scale and who have never even thought about it. They have no idea how big their plastic footprint is. And I think the work that you're doing is invaluable to try and get to start the conversation and just start the process, looking internally, like what is the situation today? And then how can we improve on that and implement different strategies to, to take it to the next step, uh, to the next level. Now, that's a fantastic tool, the plastic footprint. I'm a huge fan. It's, it's, it works hand in hand with what we're trying to do with plastic offsetting and plastic neutrality here at Seven Clean Seas. You also spoke quite a lot about kind of extended producer responsibility, which again is another very powerful tool we all have trying to fix this problem to use against the issues of ocean plastic pollution. But I'd like to turn the question to Jocelyn now and ask kind of beyond EPR and, and looking at plastic footprints, what tools or solutions do we have, does humanity have to try and fix this problem? That's a really big question. Um, <laughs> you know, I think we have more than we think would be my simple my simple response. Um, and uh, and that's really in, encouraging. Um, so, you know, I guess what came up a couple of times and even when you talk about plastic footprinting, I just love to use an example of the current cohort for the Plastics Data Challenge. Um, we have an innovator that's working on a certification and plastic footprinting program um, but we're specifically looking at, you know, how we can create more data in the space and recognizing there's a huge value on data. Everyone's asking for it, whether you're an investor, a policymaker, um, whether you're the actual entrepreneur trying to actually define the problem that you want to solve, whether you're a corporate who's trying to build efficiencies across your supply chain, the lack of data in this space is a huge systemic barrier. Um, and so, you know, just looking at that, that one solution, um, we, you know, we did a, a market research around um, where were certain solutions that were maybe trying to tackle this and, and trying to tackle it, understanding the com complex decentralized waste management systems that are in Asia. So not thinking of more centralized and organized formal waste management systems that you'd see in say the US and the UK, but thinking of Asia, South and Southeast Asia, where we have a different context who and where are some of these innovations that could potentially address this huge barrier we're seeing? Um, and, you know, we originally hadn't heard of that many. Um, and when we launched the Plastic Data Challenge, you know, we, we were really curious about how many were actually out there, um, recognizing that there's a lot of potential for this space. Think of ag tech or agritech. Right, um, that came from a call for more transparency and visibility across those global, highly active supply chains. Um, and so, but it took a movement to increase the investment and interest into that space. And so we realized we're at that early stage that Agritech was, you know, maybe a decade ago, but where could this new, you know, where could the data solutions in plastic waste management be? Um, and we were surprised to have, um, we received over 200 applications from all over the globe. I think it was 59 countries. And out of those, there were almost 100 from 39 countries that had some sort of functioning prototype and already had a track record or testing on the ground or already had data sets being collected. And, that, and 
those are, as I mentioned, from 39 countries. So we were, and those countries were Africa. They're you know, within Africa, they were within Latin America, they were within um, uh, South and Southeast Asia, as well as expanding into Eastern Asia as well. Um, and, and so, you know, we were really blown away by the fact that these solutions exist. Um, how we harness them and how we give them the right support to scale um, is a different question. And that's, that's the question and the problem that we're, we're looking to address with the incubation network. So, you know, to simply answer that, I think humanity as a whole, we have endless solution as long as we have endless hope. And as long as we have innovative minds that are given the right tools and resources to actually turn those ideas and solutions into, you know, whether it's a venture or, you know, model that can be adapted, bought, licensed, whatever it might be, it comes in different shapes and sizes. Um, so, you know, I think all the solutions are out there. It's just, can we give them the right support to actually make a change? And so, yeah, that's kind of, maybe that sounds like a real fluffy answer, but I mean, I, I, I'd have to go through, we'd have to sit here for months for me to talk <laughs> through all the different avenues that solutions sit in. But, um, yeah, I, I hope that that, that answered. Yeah, yeah. Sorry for the broad question, but fantastic answer. I know you guys are doing a lot of work specifically looking at data. And I just think as a tool, if we look at data as a tool, it is potentially our most invaluable one moving forward. Like you say, we just have to build the data sets, which currently are not there. Completely. It, it's foundational to this space, right? Once the data exists, not only is that an avenue for innovation, but there's so much innovation that can be unlocked on top of that. Once there's more transparency, visibility, and available data, um, and also just you know thinking of how to collect data and the applications of data unlocks a whole new thinking of how we apply current technologies that are being used in other fields, whether they're environmental, whether it's public services, et cetera. Um, you know, looking at transportation, looking at agriculture, looking at all these um, different tools that are being used there and how could they be applied to the sector? You know, we have some of our innovators using innovative approaches to, you know, sensor technologies, um, you know, aligned with AI and machine learning um, on the vision side and other sides we have um, uh, yeah, we have individuals that were exploring blockchain um, that were in our applicants. Um, so you just, you see all these different technologies being used in really innovative ways. Um, and it's exciting to see and think of what that can unlock moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. I think one great demonstration from your recent kind of cohort and the, the vast kind of geographical spread of applications just shows us again that we're not working on this in isolation. I think the three of us are based in, in Asia and I don't know about you, but for me, it feels all too often like I'm just, I'm speaking in an Asian bubble. The people I'm speaking to are based here, they're operating in these locations, whether they're kind of VP level in, in big multinational companies, they're still focusing on this, on this particular region. But everywhere else is working at the same time equally. And there's so many people out there that are brilliant coming up with these solutions. And I think with kind of platforms like the, the incubation network, hopefully they get to come kind of to the forefront, um, kind of no matter where they are based globally, whether it is kind of sub-Saharan Africa or Latin America, like you say. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so I guess kind of move, moving on from that one, um, there are a lot of kind of policy, policy driven and data driven solutions, but one of the big solutions, and this is a this is a question for you, for you, Dan, actually, I think you'll be able to help with this one. One big solution that is coming up time and time again is bioplastics. Now, for those people out there that don't know, plastics are made from hydrocarbons usually, and these hydrocarbons are pumped out. Uh, they're produced from either oil or, or, or natural gas, and we create kind of synthetic, uh, synthetic plastics. Now, there is a whole other avenue of making polymers, which is using plant-based material, whether that is kind of cornstarch, cassava starch, um, sugar cane, palm oil, various different things, but they come with the, the all too kind of common tag that they can be biodegradable, they'll never be an issue if they get into the natural environment, they're the, they're the, the silver bullet, the, the golden gun for, for, um, for the plastic pollution crisis we're in. But we hear it, we're not seeing it. So what's going on, Dan? Yeah, that's a um, quite a hot topic and uh, one that's massively contested at any of the um, cycling conferences we go to or the sustainability conferences. And yeah, it's not a silver bullet and people are desperate for it because they look at the state of our environment and they just want a solution and it's a knee-jerk reaction. And a lot of people sadly are capitalizing on greenwashing 
which is essentially marketing your product on somebody else's uh, need or desperate need to have a solution. I've seen a few examples, even years ago, I went to a local Warwick University and they'd been sold the dream by um, somebody, like a vegware type company selling the PLA cups. They look exactly like polypropylene cups, number five recyclable. The polyprop cups are fully recyclable here in the UK and globally it's a, it's a commodity. Um, now they've been changed to the PLA cups and I said, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, they're fully compostable. Okay, great. Well, they, didn't, no, they never followed up with how that happens. And so I said, all right, well, where do I put it? Oh, I'll just put it in the bin. Looked at the bin, nothing on there at all. And there was no infrastructure to be able to cope if that was being sold consciously and with the care that it should have been sold with, they would have had a dedicated compost network to be able to then go to an industrial composting site for it then to be able to um, follow the life cycle assessment that it would have been sold under and they'd have bought into under that. Again, it never gets followed through. It's just a quick sale, off it goes. So in, unless you're in a big environment, festival or um, a London Marathon type place where all the waste management can be controlled, it's not taken elsewhere, and then it can be brought back to one place. But then actually, if that can happen, why not recycle it? And the argument I put forward is if you were setting up a waste management company to extend the infrastructure which is required, why would you set up to take on board um, biodegradable plastics? Um, you, you wouldn't. There's no in financial incentive to do it. And if you would, it, it normally costs to take in biodegradable or, um, materials that are going to have a calorie value to put into an anaerobic digestion plant, something like that, or industrial composting. That, that's got a cost to it. Well, with plastics, when you collect them and they're segregated, there's a value to it. People get paid for it, and you can make a lot more commercial sense of it. And there isn't that commercial driver to really develop biodegrading type PLA plastics. Now, there is another side to plastics, which people are, I think Coke and Pepsi and some of the big brands are developing compatible bioplastics. Now these are not called biodegradable, they're called bioplastics and they're from a bio-based source, which is compatible with normal thermoplastics. And that is definitely um, worth looking at and investigating and, and pushing if it's tried and proved that it can be completely compatible with our limited capacity to take a certain amount of plastics. So with our waste management infrastructure at the moment, it's set up and it's geared. Imagine you've invested five, 10 million pounds in a recycling plant, and it's called a, what we call over here a MRF or a PERF, which is a materials recovery facility or a plastics recovery facility. And you've got four target materials, polyprop, PET, HDPE, and maybe LDP for your film section. And then suddenly you get another curveball thrown in there, which is biodegradable plastics, which don't have a value. They cost you to get rid of, and they contaminate your target materials, which you had commercial views to get it into a position that makes the whole plant sustainable and viable. And suddenly you have an influx of biodegradable plastics. It's just going to throw your business model out. It doesn't make sense anymore, and it costs you to get rid of it. And it's not likely to end up in an industrial compost because it has to be just compostable material, which is going to be contaminated. And uh, yeah, it's definitely, um, I think you've, you've alluded to it quite a few times, Tom, and um, the, the, the veil is slowly being lifted on biodegradable plastics and they're not the silver bullet they've been cracked up to be. Yeah, it's great. And just to, for a point of clarification, so if a biodegradable plastic does not get um, collected and, and processed through a composting facility, what's likely to happen to it? Will it biodegrade in the natural environment? No, I think there's been a lot of research and we could probably cite some um, research after, after this goes, but um, no, it doesn't. I think there's been a lot of use cases where it's still, it needs to be at a certain temperature uh, mixed with a certain amount of pressure to be, for it to then degrade. And even then it doesn't have a lot of caloric value. So it's not of any significant value to somebody who runs industrial compost or a uh, an anaerobic digestion plant, for example, where it would be compatible. I, I'm not exactly clued up on that side of things, so I need to clarify, but that's what I know so far. Maybe yeah. Maggie, Maggie's nodding like yeah, she is. I'd like to add on to that because I uh, completely agree with what Dan has mentioned. Um, but there are scenarios. I, was, I must be the devil, devil's advocate. Um, 
Yeah. While I would say that a, a vast majority of scenarios when bio-based um, plastics or even bioplastics or biodegradable plastics or compostable plastics are used, they're being used in a way that actually is more disruptive than being helpful for the environment, unfortunately. But there are specific cases where it could succeed. So I would say like 99% percent of the time we're seeing it as a silver bullet which is definitely wrong but um, imagine if you're on a tropical island um, one of those resort destinations that I never afford to go to um, and um, we have something that's actually um, a very small island let's say like an atoll in the Maldives for example um, you really can't afford to landfill or incinerate it's neither so that's also where I would think that uh, a bile digester could come in to actually um, perform this type of um, digestion or degradation of the material if they can collect every piece so that's exactly what dan mentioned if you're in a in a theme park a hospital a, a university campus for example where the um where the waste is being centrally processed then there is a chance that um food tainted material can actually look explore into the compostable material uh, area but if not if it is easily washable or reusable um then it could be recycled then why not like why not make it out of recycled material that can be further recycled so um as you can see here um if you're listening to us right now um it's a very esoteric uh subject matter and a lot of people need to really read up on this it's not um easy to make choices that um that are beneficial for the environment on the get-go um and it's it's hard for everyone because there was no such thing as a plastic uh expert until the recent years uh, i think my husband who's listening in right now i think he got a lot of uh, a lot of crap from me by for, for for doing the wrong thing with the recycling i was like no it's not going to get recycled don't do that and, or wash it you're supposed to recycle it so uh i think i can speak for many households with uh with someone particularly who's uh, interested in um how to be um more conscious of the environment and how do we actually make a difference but if you're listening um, from a point of view of someone who's in this um, uh, research or this discipline or interested in furthering your um, your understanding of marine litter I'd just like to make a very quick advertisement here is that um, the United Nations Environment Program Sea Circular is now um, um, running a, a course called Marine Litter um, Massive Open Online Course. It is free of charge, and I would advise anyone who's interested in this um, subject matter to look into it. It's run by the Open Universität of um, the uh, Netherlands, and it will run again this September. And so um, please um, go online to search for this, and it will be now in uh, Bahasa Indonesia, Vietnamese, and Thai languages will be incorporated in this run, along with all the official languages of the United Nations. So um, hopefully we have a, a solution for that to educate people how marine litter came to be. It's not just plastics. It's not just people who maliciously litter. Um, there are leakages in the system as well that contributes to this overall mass of uh, amassing of marine litter. So um, it's not when you recycle everything, everything properly and if you dispose everything properly, um, then this problem would not exist. It would still exist, unfortunately. And uh, we have to break the bad news to you. But on the other hand, we have people like Jocelyn and Dan and also Tom, of course, working very hard to make sure that we can connect the dots. We can make sure that um, all possible um, leakage is being taken care of, either by um, amending the infrastructure, amending the current systems that we have in place for recycling, making things circular and from design point and all the way to consumption and post-consumption, and also to have innovative choices so that um, we're educated about this and also weeding out those false messiahs that Dan has spoken of. I'm sure that um, these inventors probably had in mind of um, the environment's best interests when they put together these types of alternative materials. Unfortunately, in the real world, it just does not make sense at all for us to ap apply them on a mass, mass scale. So that's also why it's important for us to refer to the sources, refer to something that's um, trustworthy, either from your local governments or local green groups, such as WWF, Greenpeace, um, United Nations Environment Program, and all the grassroots NGOs that are from your local communities, they can actually give you more um, specific advice as to what would be a better alternative. It's not always better to go paper or to go glass. Um, it actually takes a lot more, Dan has touched on this, but it takes a lot more carbon 
to um, transport glass across the world. So it does not make sense if you're consuming Evian in a place where the water is not potable, don't actually opt for something that's actually a glass bottle that's transported half across the globe. It makes a lot of difference because climate change is also a very pressing issue. We do not want to actually deviate ourselves from this um, overall um, overall plan to um, to tackle um, climate crisis by actually like shooting ourselves in the foot because we want to avoid plastics at all costs. Yeah, that's really important, Maggie. And yeah, some, some really interesting points. And one of the biggest things I see on social media when I get involved with um, anti-plastics and um, some of the groups that are just really lobbying for that knee-jerk reaction, looking for that silver bullet, let's just go back to glass. We used to go back to glass. That was quite a few years ago in a not very developed society. And I think research has been proven. The greenest thing you can do is obviously out of the tap. The next one after that is reuse your plastic bottle that you bought and just refill that. That's the lowest carbon impact, the lowest in terms of fuel consumption, all those other areas. So um, yeah, looking backwards for a solution and, and summary isn't the right way. But also when you're looking forward for solutions and a lot of these inventors are coming up with new materials, what they're not doing on the whole there are exceptions to this is making sure their product is compatible with the current waste infrastructure and i quite like the point you drew about being on an atoll and funnily enough i was on an atoll in the uh, cape verde islands probably about eight years ago and i looked at their waste management program and they were just landfilling and then it's full and now what they don't have enough material to have any substantial value to justify separating it and transporting it to somewhere else so they just put it on a bonfire and burnt it on the beach and I actually took um, some drone video of it and the wind comes and it's blowing it and they put a load of leaves and branches and foliage on top but as soon as that burnt off you could see they're just burning all the waste and it was horrible you know you've got beautiful marine life there and I just it just broke my heart to see it but they didn't have any other solutions but then you've got another problem um, which is this is about looking at problems and working out solutions um, and this is not just an atoll based scenario, it's global. So when you take that scenario of the um, a small island, you've got limited material. If you could say to them, right, we're only taking this type of material, this biodegradable packaging, and we can put that into our biodigester and we can actually try to really find um, a solution that doesn't allow the stuff to escape into the marine or life burning on the beach and all those archaic solutions if we can look at that then that would be great but how do you then regulate imports how do you change the consumption from a big hotel that wants to order all the premium brands that uh, guests are used to how do you then say right no well, that's not allowed here same for in the uk if we were to say right just these types of packaging and there is um there is packaging design out there from government bodies like wrap and recoup who are um in the UK here, and they've designed documents, the recyclability by design document, which I was um, able to contribute to quite a few years ago, which set out the recyclability of an item into a traffic light system of green, red, and amber. So ideally packaging designers would be looking to hit the criteria to make a packaging that fit the green light system, recyclable, um, easy to recycle here in the UK, and it worked as a function, main packaging, uh, function for the packaging. But um, if it didn't hit that criteria, it's going to be very hard to get it into a state where we can move forward to find that solution for these uh, for these types of materials. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting point as well. I mean, given the governments and the regulators, the tools they require to actually make good decisions that will then have a positive effect on on the the overall kind of like you say designability by design so recyclability by design now i am conscious of time and we are running a little bit over here so i'm sorry but i'd just like to get back to uh, jocelyn on that because um it's quite interesting that you say um when, when we're looking at these solutions and we're looking at kind of these large almost systemic changes that are required in order to to fix the solution but really kind of how do we get there i mean it's great saying okay we need systemic change we need consumer change, we need government change, regulation change, infrastructure change, all at the same time. But like, how can we really achieve systemic change, particularly in this kind of area? Yeah, again, you give me the biggest questions, but I love it, I'll take the challenge. Um, 
I think that's the, the thing is there's no easy answer for this, right? Um, but there needs to be players from all end that are that are willing to act and have incentive to act, whether that's economic incentive, whether it's push or pull incentives. Um, you know, there needs to be um, that existing across uh, across kind of sectors from public to private and then across the actors within those sectors from you know, with governments, it needs to just not be on, um, you know, a regional international agency level. It needs to go reach all the way down to local municipalities who are handling waste management systems. As far as in the private sector, um, while there's a call for innovators, there needs to be a similarly incentive and support for those um, support institutions that provide in innovations and ventures, especially those that are early stage that hold a lot of risk to help them scale and get to the point where they can then um, feed into the system. Um, and there also needs to be obviously alignment from the corporates. Um, some of those that are in this space may be somewhat responsible for, for, some, uh, for some of the activities, both upstream and downstream in the space, but also those that um, just engage with packaging and plastics um, as parts of their supply chains and value chains. Um, whether you know you have a bit of plastic or a lot of plastic in that. How do you rethink circular solutions? Um, you know, it's I. One of my colleagues highlights this all the time that I really appreciate that that waste is man-made. Waste is a result of inefficiencies in a system. So you know, in 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 a society that's always trying to build efficiencies to save a dollar or to make an extra profit? How can we have economies that function and think of how do we make sure that that plastic, which has a value um, and which costs money to produce, how do we maintain the same mindset with the fact of how do we avoid waste? Because waste is inherently an inefficiency. Um, and so how do businesses, governments, societies, how do we all act in a way that produces less waste? So. You know, I, I know one of your kind of sample questions were, you know, should solutions be, you know, is it is the, you know, is the responsibility falling on the consumer? Is it on the companies? You know, is it on the policymakers? And I think we all have a shared responsibility, um, and that needs to be acknowledged. Um, I think again, there needs to be this this mix of in, incentives and movements, both some push, some pull, and um, that all need to be in play. Um, and we need to not be intimidated, stopped, or gridlocked by the chicken and the egg. Um, you know, when you when you play in this systemic uh, challenge, sometimes it seems so big, and it seems, uh, you know, there's power dynamics and all this at play, and and you often find yourself again and again in chicken and egg scenarios. Who steps first? Who takes the first step? And I just encourage to take a step because at some at some point we're going to be faced side by side, and you're gonna we're gonna have to move the same direction. Um, yeah. So, you know, like, you know, whether do we do, you know, do we do plastic footprinting first for the corporates or do we come up with this new innovation over here that replaces plastics? Do we, you know, build a waste to energy plant here or do we wait to create, you know, this or that? I think that, you know, I hear this time and time again. And I guess I just encourage everyone just take the step because if we all take a step at some point, we'll meet at a middle point and we'll look around us and actually see what's possible. And then we can make the best decisions. Um, you know, but if we don't start testing that solution over there that we're not sure if it's going to work. And if we don't start testing that other solution over there, whether it's a policy solution, whether it's, you know, a, a venture or a startup, if, if we just don't start trying and testing and taking these steps, we're actually, you know, we're not, we're never going to make any progress. So, um, yeah, so that would be, that would be kind of my, my input on that. And I think that's why, while we really represent and stand for these innovators and entrepreneurs, we don't, you know, exclude in our network those policymakers. We don't exclude the corporates. We don't exclude those because we all have to be streamlined and work together. Um, and we all have to be aware of what each other are doing. Otherwise, we waste money, we waste efforts talking about waste, um, trying to do the same thing that someone's already been doing and been working on for five years, and now we're going to restart it, et cetera, right? So I think that there's a really big importance of making sure there's full transparency and making sure there's coordinated efforts um, and um, that everyone's kind of involved in a community and shared discussions about that. And so, um, yeah, that's the important of a network. That's the important of um, human-centered design, community-centered design and, and approaches to systemic issues. So, um, yeah, yeah. And I think like one thing we didn't touch on, but I know we don't have time for, and which we could go down is just 
Also, again, stressing the importance of the people behind this challenge and this solution. Today is World Oceans Day. Um, while oceans are the environment, oceans are also the source of livelihood for you know, millions of people across the world. And a lot of those people, especially here in South and Southeast Asia, um, are often more marginalized um, and often more vulnerable populations. And so we can't exclude them from conversations that may seem environmental um, because um, they are part of that equation. Uh, a lot of those population, uh, populations and uh, also include um, uh, uh, a lot of women and, and who systemically are sometimes ignored from these solutions. So again, just stressing that this is World Oceans Day and the oceans are being hurt by plastics, but you know, this is in its own a system that involves people's livelihoods, that it involves people's well-being, people's health. Um, so just making sure that when we have these discussions about solutions that um, it's not just on volumes, it's not just on numbers, but it's also on how does this affect the way that people live? Um, how does this affect how they make a living and how, um, how healthy they are um, and how that plays into those systems as well. So. Yeah, absolutely. And the importance of the people cannot be understated, particularly here in Southeast Asia. Um, what, I don't know whether a lot of our viewers will be aware, but actually kind of um, females are kind of disproportionately affected by the waste industry here in Southeast Asia. Kind of children and females make up the vast majority of waste pickers. Now, these are people that live a pretty miserable life. It's really quite sad. They don't have any of the normal kind of um, um, normal um, kind of infrastructure around having a job, things like holidays, medical, maternity leave, uh, even kind of weekends off, or even just a minimum wage that we all take for granted. And as a result, it becomes kind of self-perpetual. And that's one thing that I know at Seven Clean Seas we're very, um, very, very mindful of. How do you try and fix the problem? And I know this is a, a sea circular kind of stance as well, but without actually causing these people to lose their jobs because they're that vulnerable. But at the same time, how do we walk the extremely th small tightrope so that we're not kind of, we're not affecting, negatively affecting these marginalized groups and their jobs, but we're actually not encouraging it and creating more, more jobs and more, um, more labor flow into, into that area. And that's, a, that's going to be the age old question, I think, um, for anybody working in this space is how to, to really walk that tightrope and make sure we are helping the oceans because it is, that's why we're here today talking about this is World Ocean Day, but there are oceans don't work in, in, in kind of, um, well, they work in union with humans, unfortunately, and we've got to make sure that we're looking after these groups as well. Um, so we are well and truly over time. It's seven past seven in Singapore, which is a, just a coincidence, you know, a lot of sevens in my life. But there is one last question that I'd like to ask, because I know we've spoken about a lot of policy, a lot of things that may even sound a little bit negative, as well as some hopeful things on the horizon. But the bottom line is kind of, do you think we can save the oceans from plastic pollution? Please just jump in if you've, if you've got any thoughts on yeah. that. I think we can. We've got to have positive mental attitude, PMA. It's in all aspects of our life and it shouldn't be excluded from uh, the mammoth task of trying to clear up our oceans. And again, coming back to things like the smoking ban, it wasn't achievable in lots of people's views and then suddenly it is. So with that as a bit of a benchmark, we need to be hitting that with the same social pressure, um, education, Maggie talked earlier about um, her exercise analogy and our unhealthy addiction to packaging and waste and that exercise I could draw on that analogy to push it into education, um, which is teaching you to eat the right things, consume the right stuff and buy the right packaging and maybe just reduce your consumption of unnecessary things, which then leads to the cultural change. And we're not, um, when we're born, we're not, we're open to lots of different inputs into our lives and it's making sure we take those positive inputs and having that positive education to teach us to look after ourselves um, but again it is a, a tall order and we all need to come together to try to achieve achieve that oneness but um yeah i'll leave it on a positive note <laughs> i'm sure we can have some more discussions about things later on but yeah thanks tom i'm sure Mag maggie do you have any thoughts on that are you feeling positive well, it's, um, we'd better get it done. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll do it or die trying. So um, the w echoing 
um, Dan, it, it is a very um, problem that's dear and near for Southeast Asia as well. And it's, uh, it makes economic sense to clean it up, not just because it's emotional to see a dugong um, crammed with uh, plastic in their stomachs and dying. It's not purely emotional that we see animals suffering. It actually affects us at the end. We already know that at WWF, that there are um, plastics in everything that we're consuming, in beer, in salt, in water, pretty much everything that we consume in the air, even in the, in, in the Arctic and the Antarctica. So that's also why um, eventually it's going to hit us and uh, we're gonna find out the worst way and we better make a difference from now on. As Jocelyn mentioned, um, there's a finger pointing game right now. Um, for businesses that are for profit, it does not make sense to become the first mover because it's a second mover advantage. Um, we do want businesses that are more conscious to step up to the game, to become champions and trailblazers so that they can lift industry standards. Um, and I truly believe in the goodness of mankind. There will be business uh, decision makers who are, um, who are very clear in what to do, what is the right thing to do, and they will do the right thing. And we're hoping that we'll be here to assist them every part of the way and that we're here to celebrate their successes and also to amplify that across the sectors. So um, with that, and also with what Jocelyn and Dan are doing, and also of course, Tom and uh, Seven Clean Seas, we're very, um, we're very heartened to see this effort, um, not just in Southeast Asia where we need help the most, but we, we, we have a lot of uh, predecessors before us in the UK, in Sweden, in, in Germany that already have splendid systems put together to tackle this problem. And so it's very hopeful for us. We just really need to take action as Jocelyn mentioned. So be the first person to do it. Um, again, another anecdote is that my husband and I went out for a, a very yummy lunch out after so many months of being confined. Um, the first thing they gave us at the restaurant was a glass of water with a straw. Uh, it was just a glass of water and then there's a straw in it already. And so we can't really reject it anymore at that point. But uh, immediately my, my husband just said, yes, can we get a comment sheet or some, can we speak with the manager, please? And of course we can do our part. You pick the, you pick the container that is more envir environmental. You want to know more about this. So you research more about what's recyclable in your regions. So that next time you do your grocery shopping, you know what you're buying. And that's actually a part of living in 2020 now. It's that we're more woke than ever. We're very conscious of what we're doing and our every action affects the environment. And so I, I ask everybody, if you're making a decision for yourself or your fit for your business or even for your country, please keep this in mind. And that this problem is actually much bigger than just poor animals suffering. Thanks. Not really a high note, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good though, but we are more woke than ever. And being woke isn't just for the cool kids. Like, we all have to be and making a purposeful, conscious effort to know what's going on, know what we're consuming and make better decisions. Jocelyn, yeah. do you have anything to add? Absolutely. I, I mean, you know, I guess the bright light of this is 2020 has been a hard year for a lot of different reasons in a lot of different places. And well, really all over the world, right? <laughs> um, but if you look at the bright light that's come out of 2020, it's that we've realized we need to be more resilient and we're strong enough to be more resilient. But the interesting thing about strength and resilience that we found in 2020 is that no one thinks they can be strong or resilient by themselves. Everyone's kind of reassessed how important community is and how important working together is. And to get any change happening, whether it's change in health, whether it's change in inclusion and equality, and where I'm thinking is whether it's change in, in, the, in how we treat the environment and how we build a more sustainable future. So we globally are recognizing that we need to be more strong. We need to be resilient. We have to have a longer perspective on these things. We can't just think about tomorrow. We have to think about into the future. And that the only way we can be prepared for worst case scenarios in this world or the only way we can implement change is by recognizing where our community is and what our community can help us with. So if we can build the same action oriented, passionate, focused, you know, empowered communities that we're seeing in 2020, like try to save lives, trying to make a difference. I think we can do the same with the environment um, and, you know, social media and how globalized and, and efficient we've become at sending messages 
we can definitely increase awareness and action around this cause um, to across generations and across boundaries. So, you know, I guess I feel very hopeful that something could could come of this, and that if anything, that we just build a more empowered and passionate and um, resilient and strong community. That's uh, the global community around the plastics crisis and around saving our oceans. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for finishing that on such a, a nice positive note. Um, I'm very much in the camp with uh, with Maggie. We're going to fix this or die trying. We're on the front lines going and uh, with people working together. And like you say, with communities rallying all around the world for very, very meaningful causes, this will happen and it will happen for ocean plastic pollution as well. So I'd like to say thank you, a huge thank you actually to all of our panel panelists today. Um, I think today was a very, um, a very insightful conversation. We covered a lot of very different um, topics or looking at the same issue from very different angles. And that's what people need to, to truly um, learn as much as they can and, and, and have that con kind of consciousness, consciousness level of woke in their lives. Um, I'm going to steal that from you again there, Maggie. Um, but anyone, everyone tuning in, thank you so much for spending your time listening to us, engaging. We've got a couple of comments uh, on the Facebook page that we'll get through. And, uh, and really, if you want to know more about what's going on, you can follow any of these guys on, uh, on, on LinkedIn or their, their various different um, kind of business channels. And of course, Seven Clean Seas, you can follow us on our daily grind to keep the oceans clean on either Instagram, Facebook, Twitter or LinkedIn. You do have the power to make a change. We all do. And don't feel that because you're just sitting at home working in an industry that is not relevant to ocean plastic pollution, that that means you don't matter. That is absolutely incorrect. Even if it is just refusing the straw, making sure you're conscious about the different types of plastic you're consuming, recycling and buying recyclable plastic and packaging when you have to, these things add up spread the message, spread the love. And you know what? We are going to fix this problem and we're going to do it together. Thank you so much. Have a fantastic evening and love you all. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> and don't forget to mention the uh, turtle straws. Oh, yeah. So if you yeah. do want a solution for straws, a good friend of ours has a brand in the UK that makes straws out of actual straw. Google them. They're called turtle straw. I, I, this stuff grows. I mean, it doesn't get more biodegradable than that. Oh, that's and, perfect. Uh, biodegradable solution, eh? It's a fantastic solution. Check them out. Turtle straws. Thank you, everybody, again. Good night, guys. Good